Let's bring in the roundtable, ABC News political analyst Matthew Dowd, ABC News senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega, Joshua Johnson, host of NPR and WAMU's 1A, and Susan Glasser, staff writer at The New Yorker. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Thank Mother's you very Day. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cecilia, let's go back to the discussion on North Korea and Kim Jong-un. Do you think the White House, despite what John Bolton said, is pretty certain of the outcome? Is there really a chance that Donald Trump will walk away? No. I think that they're very certain of the outcome. Also, I should say that and say that I've promised to never predict anything about this White House ever again because I'm always wrong. So I say uh, I think they are very confident about the outcome because they need this victory. Do you remember what the president looked like on that runway at Joint Base Andrews at 2 in the morning? Happy. I'd never seen him happier. How much the language has changed on Kim Jong-un. We went from fire and fury and little rocket man to good, and, and he made the mistake of saying how well the prisoners, the, the detainees, had been treated at one point. Um, he was riding high out there, and they are going into this feeling extremely confident. You said it in your questions to Ambassador Bolton, though. Is North Korea going into this with the upper hand? That's the question I have from it. I've been told by sources in the White House that there are no preconditions being set for this yeah, meeting. I don't on, think there are. There are not. And so North Korea has freed the detainees. They've stopped their testing. What is the they U.S. Gotta going want, to get they, out of this? They got to want something, the North Koreans. And, and Matt, we have gone from little rocket man to this, so... Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> in his mind, in his mind, he gets the Nobel Prize. I mean, he does get, I have to say, Donald Trump does get credit up until this point, and we'll see what happens in June in the me middle of the meeting. He doesn't get as much credit as he wanted. Uh, to me, it's kind of like the Cleveland Cavaliers, where Donald Trump thinks he's LeBron James. When everybody gets credit on him, he's probably more like J.R. Smith <laughs> in this and the credit he deserves. But it shows you, I think, the response to his chaos and to what sort of his belligerent behavior what the two Koreans did in this, which is they basically put this deal together because they were like, we don't know what's going on over the United States. We better figure out a way to come to this, and obviously with China. But the president does get credit if this goes well, and there's no telling what's going to happen in June. And, and you have to, uh, I agree, you have to give him credit, but was this the strategy all along? Hey, look, they called it maximum pressure. And Donald Trump, if you look at all of his history, uh, even before he was president, he's a believer that deals come from leverage. Uh, and it can be positive leverage, negative leverage. So maximum pressure was all about in Donald Trump's mind, getting leverage. So he used that. Ironically, I, I do agree with Matt. The story here is our allies. In many ways, the South Koreans panicked. They said, wait a minute, you know, we can no longer count on the United States. We have changed the political calculus. You could feel it when you were over there, too, in South, I could in South Korea. There was, there was really a sense. Absolutely. And so it's not exactly the leverage as Trump talks about it. What I'm looking for going forward is the question of not only what do they agree to, but both parties now have a huge incentive to come out and proclaim victory here. Uh, does that actually mean that North Korea is going to denuclearize? Every expert I talk to says no, flatly. They, they don't even have any real doubt that uh, Kim is actually going to give up his nuclear weapon. So how are we going to square that circle? Both Trump and Kim need to proclaim a victory. You know, I guess it can go on for years, the process of implementing uh, this agreement that they might come to. And it sounds like it could. I, I spoke to a, a, a former intelligence official lately, and he said, which I thought was fascinating, I mean, your, your, your point about Kim Jong-un, he doesn't want to denuclearize, that's the way we've always looked at this. But he said, you know, there is a possibility, and I tried to talk to John <coughs> Bolton about that, maybe we have misread him. I mean, we, we really don't or haven't had great intel on him. They probably learned more from that meeting of him walking with President Moon from South Korea than anything. I think that's a possibility? Oh, it's, a, it's a huge possibility. You're right. We don't know that much about his regime. That's why the last year or so have been so revelatory. I, I think it also gives us a good reason to not presume that we know what he's going to do. I do agree. I do believe in some ways that he may be ready to join the rest of the international community, but now he can do it on his terms. I mean, let's not... And if he's already said he, he wants to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, I can't see him walking away. Yeah, he may want to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. That's easy to say now that you know how to build a nuke. It's easy to say now that you know how to build a ballistic missile that can reach Washington. Like, it would be one thing if we were talking about denuclearization before he succeeded with these things. But he said back in December, 
he had the success. So now we're closing off a nuclear test site whose mission has been accomplished. We're shutting down facilities that can fire weapons that they know how to build. I mean, it could be sitting on a thumb drive in Pyongyang for some and, for somewhere. And, and you always have the that irony, right. irony is, The irony is we have now basically empowered China. China is now the biggest player in the Far East. The big, by far the biggest player in it. They're the, in, instrumental in what's going on in Korea. They're now instrumental in the trade negotiations since we pulled out in this. And can you imagine, I was thinking about this, can you imagine if this was Barack Obama doing the exact same thing, what the Republicans would be saying about, wow, you're naive, I cannot believe you're doing this, look what you're doing, it's damaging and all that. So I think when you just take a look at it, yes, the president gets some credit for this, not as much as he thinks he gets, but I think the time will tell in June and what happens in the aftermath. And, and Cecilia, I want to move to Iran if we could ripping up that deal. It was it was overshadowed a bit by uh, North Korea, the good news about North Korea so far. But get, pulling out of that deal, do you think they really have a plan B? I mean, I know they've said, oh, we're in plan B now. We just say it's not working. No, I, I don't know that they do. Um, I, I was struck by the chorus of reaction from our own allies. Germany and Britain and France all joining together in this joint statement. Macron calling the White House just yesterday uh, fearful of what's going to happen in the region. That scathing statement from President Obama saying that this was so misguided. And the reaction from the White House to all of that was that's really no comment. They really didn't even address it. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there are still discussions happening behind closed doors about what Plan B will look like, but we also know there are huge divisions in this White House on this very topic with Ambassador Bolton on one side and Secretary Mattis on the other. So who go, where they does, go from it does here, show, it no does, one knows. It does show, I mean, it, who would have guessed that the first one to violate that treaty would be us and not Iran? I mean, we're the first one in violation of this treaty. And I think, as I listened to John Bolton earlier, I couldn't help but think we were in a Back to the Future movie when the tag team of Benjamin Netanyahu and John Bolton in 2003 was pushing almost, the exact, same, almost the exact same out. language. You just substitute Inspection Iran and in Iraq. It's almost the exact same language. We've been to this rodeo before. It cost us thousands of lives and trillions of dollars, and it feels like we're going to the same place again. Okay, so, Susan, I want to take this to you, though. When we've gone through the North Korea discussions in the past year, everyone has panicked, oh, he shouldn't do this, he shouldn't say that. It brought him to the table. Is, is there a chance that this is a good thing and they could renegotiate a better deal? I think it's very unlikely that the Iranians are going to be coming to the table anytime soon. Uh, I do agree with one thing, though, which is the idea that Europe is now going to stand up to us and have some kind of a unified response. Very unlikely. It was a very interesting moment in your interview with Ambassador Bolton where you read him this very tough editorial, uh, you know, from a leading German publication. And he, uh, he said it's it silly. He yeah. said it's silly. It's not silly because this is what our allies now believe. Uh, and uh, they know that very well in the White House. In fact, I reported that Ambassador Bolton told a national security advisor to one of the, the three European nations weeks ago before any of this, he said the president is going to get rid of this Iran nuclear deal. It's very likely. I would have done it myself months ago. So all of this hue and cry as if this was a surprising decision. I think Ambassador Bolton is absolutely correct that, that people who really looked at the situation understood that Trump was going to do this. Arguably, the focus of his foreign policy, as Matt said, is to move into a period of confrontation with Iran in the broader Middle East. And I think that's what makes people so nervous right now. Rather than a new deal, it's much likelier that there will be a new war in the Middle East. And, and the message to North Korea in all of this with the Iran deal? It's, it's kind of a confusing message, because if you look at the way these two different nuclear matters are being handled, you know, Kim Jong-un is offering some kind of verification of their nuclear program. The Iran deal included some kind of verification, but that deal's dead and this deal's moving forward. There were economic sanctions involved to bring Iran into the world's economy. That's the same thing that we're offering to North Korea, but we're dealing with these. They, they, they don't feel congruent. And also you have two parties, North and South Korea, who have already begun talking and already begun trying to make peace. You don't have anybody talking to Israel right now trying to make peace. So I'm not sure whether there is a consistent strategy. There might, that might be partly the reason why this editorial in Der Spiegel was so strident, because you will have Europe speaking with one voice. You will have Europe saying, we need to go to the table and do this 
together, particularly if America's foreign policy continues to be so transactional, where you treat this party in one way and another party in another way to meet campaign promises or, or personal aims or views, the lack of consistency potentially could be a problem down the road, and I think Europe sees that. Okay, and Cecilia, I want to turn back into the White House this week. John McCain released a statement urging the Senate to vote against Gina Haspel as CIA director because of the role she played in the agency's torture program. A White House staffer in a meeting Thursday said McCain's criticism, quote, doesn't matter, he's dying anyway. Joe Biden put out a statement in response saying people have wondered when decency would hit rock bottom with the administration. It happened yesterday. A new rock bottom or more of the same? Uh, a combination of both, perhaps. Um, l look, I think this is a story that we're three days in now, and I guarantee you it's still going to be the subject of the briefing tomorrow, if there is one. Uh, th no apologies. <laughs> No apologies, and I don't think we're going to get one. And until you do, this story is not going to go away. And right now, I think the perception from many people looking at the way this White House has responded to it is that they're not as concerned about the content of that statement as they are about the fact that it leaked out. And then Sarah Sanders met with her staff, and I don't think anyone condones this statement, but uh, chastised her staff for this leaking out, and then that leaked out again that meeting. So, look, do they have a problem with leaks? Absolutely. But let's not forget this is a president who said some pretty horrible things about John McCain. Okay. And, and, and not only is it leaks, it's, it's public. John Kelly this week, the chief of staff, John Kelly, uh, was in the spotlight for his comments on immigration to National Public Radio. Let's listen. The vast majority of the people that move illegally into the United States are not bad people. They're not criminals, they're not MS-13. But they're also not people that would easily assimilate into the United States. They're uh, overwhelmingly rural people. In the countries they come from, fourth, fifth, sixth grade educations are kind of the norm. I'm gonna go to you on that one, Matt. Uh, um, I think it's just totally outrageous. Not only outrageous just from a general standpoint, but to, for, for somebody whose last name is Kelly, somebody whose last name is Dowd, who's, whose ancestors came here, uh, without any education, uh, with, with a very lacking ability to assimilate, as he calls it in language, along with almost every other culture in our country. Chinese, Koreans, African Americans after slavery. The same thing was said after slavery. They're not going to be able to assimilate. Why are we doing this? What's happening? All this. I think this, along with what happened with John McCain, is a much bigger thing, which is it reflects the culture in the White House. This is, John Kelly represents a culture in the White House that views the world in this way. And along with those comments, it says, we're going to say and do anything. We're not going to apologize. And this is what we are. But for the son or the grandson of Irish immigrants to say thing, something like that is really outrageous. Okay, and that's going to be the last word, another week in the White House and another one to come. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.